the Lagrange points are places of interest, of, of equilibrium, of balance in the solar system. Uh, every single pair of orbiting objects in the solar system comes with its own set of Lagrange points. So the Sun-Earth system has Lagrange points, the Earth-Moon system has the Lagrange points, the Sun-Jupiter system has Lagrange points, and so on. And there are five Lagrange points for every one of these systems. Uh, three of them sit in a line with the orbiting objects, and then two sit at 60 degree angles from those. The history of Lagrange points goes back to their discoverer, uh, the French astronomer, physicist, uh, super genius, uh, Joseph Louis Lagrange. Although he wasn't entirely French, he was actually born in Italy as Giuseppe Luigi Lagrange. Uh, but then when he was like 50 years old, he moved to France and then France just like claimed him as one of their own. In fact, he's buried in the Pantheon in Paris, which is if, if you're French, that, that's a really big deal. So he was working in the mid to late 1700s and he worked out the physics of Lagrange points in uh, 1772. Now he was basing his work on previous work by another super genius named Leonard Euler, uh, who had discovered three of the Lagrange points, and then Lagrange himself discovered the remaining two. But since we uh, named like everything after Euler, that's a whole other story, uh, we had to share the credit and the love around a little bit, so we called them Lagrange points. Both Euler and Lagrange were working on a nefariously difficult problem in Newtonian physics. So Newton had developed his universal law of gravitation in the late 1600s, and it's super awesome, it's super fantastic, it can explain so many things throughout the universe. In some cases, though, the math is a little bit easier than in other cases. In Newtonian gravity, when you're trying to calculate the gravitational interaction between two objects, it's super simple. You can, you can write down the formula, you can solve it. Uh, it takes relatively straightforward math to be able to do it. And then once you have that solution, you, you, have, you have a crystal ball that you can use. You can predict the future. You know how these objects will behave and interact with each other uh, and, and how they'll move and how they'll evolve. It, it's, it's really straightforward and it's, it's very magical. But once you incorporate a third object, it all goes haywire in an instant. And this problem is called the three-body problem. The three-body problem is basically impossible to directly solve. That's impossible! You cannot write down a solution with pencil and paper. A solution to the three-body problem where you have three objects of any given mass uh, and trying to predict how they will interact gravitationally. You can't. You just can't write it down. Uh, today, in modern times, we have computers that can crunch the numbers, uh, but that's like sort of cheating. You're, yes, you're getting a solution, but it's based on the accuracy of your computer, and it's not based on some, some equation that you can just write down. Both Euler and Lagrange were very interested in this three-body problem, and they were able to find a restricted version of the three-body problem that did allow them to write down solutions. And in the restricted case, you're going to assume that the third object, the third mass, is so small that its mass doesn't matter. So if you're looking at the sun and the earth, and then you have a tiny grain of dust, and you're looking at the interaction, the behavior, through gravity of that tiny grain of dust. Yes, technically the grain of dust exerts a gravitational influence on the Earth and the Sun, but also it's not very much and you can basically ignore it. So that's what Euler and Lagrange did. The next thing they did was they only looked at the solution in two dimensions, in the plane of the orbit. So they ignored any uppy-downy motion. This greatly simplified the problem. And once they made these assumptions, they were able to write down a solution to this notoriously difficult problem of the three-body problem. And this is where the Lagrange points appear. Uh, like I mentioned at the top of the video, the Lagrange points are, are places of balance. They're places where the gravitational effects of the two bodies that you're looking at are, are canceled out.
So for example, the way I like to think about it, say, say you're standing on the moon and you see the earth above you. And if you, you, you hold an apple in your hand and you drop it, you let go. What is it going to do? It's going to drop. It's going to fall to the moon. Let's say you can stretch your arm out way up as tall as you can go. You're pointing it at the earth, but then you let go. What happens? It drops to the moon. Now let's say you could stretch your arm millions of miles, like you know, super stretch arm strong here. You're going, you're going, you're going, you're going, you're going, you're going, and you stretch your hand out so far that that apple that you're holding is now grazing the top of our of the Earth's atmosphere. When you let go, what's gonna what's gonna happen? It's not gonna drop to the moon, it's too close to the earth. So instead it's gonna fall to the earth. So you can imagine there's this uh, balance point. On one side, if you stretch too far, the thing will fall to the earth. And if you don't stretch far enough, the thing will fall to the moon. But there's a point where you can let go and the gravity of the earth and the moon are in perfect balance. This is the first Lagrange point, the balance point. Uh, in the Sun-Earth system, there's a Lagrange point about one one hundredth of the way closer in towards the sun from the earth. That's our gravitational balance point. Now the second Lagrange point uh, sits outside of the orbiting body. So, so let's take, for example, the Sun and the Earth system. Uh, L1 sits in between, that's the gravitational balance point, balance point between the Sun and the Earth. Uh, there's another balance point on the outside of the Earth. Usually, if you're in an orbit further away from the Sun than the Earth is, you're going to be slower. Your orbital period will be longer. It, it's, that's just the way physics works. You're further away from the Sun, so the gravity of the Sun is weaker, so things are going to be a little bit slower back here. But there's a very, very specific point. If you get close enough to the Earth, the Earth, the gravity of the Earth starts to pull on you starts to tug you along. Now, if you get too close to the, earth, to the Earth, the gravity of the Earth is so strong that you just you know, crash into the Earth. But there's, a, again, a balance point here where you want to go slower because you're in a further orbit, but the Earth is right there in front of you and its own gravity is tugging you along, so you keep pace with it. And so it stays in that position. That is the second Lagrange point. The third Lagrange point is exactly the same, but it's on the opposite of the side of the sun as the Earth is. Now, the fourth and fifth Lagrange points, these are, these are pretty tricky. Even I, I have a hard time understanding or, or conceptualizing how it works. I just have to trust the mathematics. Uh, but one way to think about it is you're going to draw a triangle between the sun, the Earth, and then your third object. And this triangle is going to be a perfect isosceles triangle. So 60 degrees all the way around. And you're going to do it on the other side too. So one of these will be L4, one of these will be L5. Now these Lagrange points, they sit in the same orbit as the Earth, but they're leading and following the Earth by 60 degrees. And if you imagine you're in one of these positions, you're orbiting too along with the Earth. You're like leading the Earth in its orbit. You've got the Sun over here, the Earth over here. You want to move towards the Sun, but the Earth pulls you back. And you want to go towards the Earth, but the Sun pulls you back. Again, it's this balance point that matters. And so that is your five Lagrange points. There are five for the Earth-Sun system, five for the Earth-Moon, five for Earth-Jupiter, etc., etc. Three of those Lagrange points are unstable. So they're all places of equilibrium. They're all places where the gravity, the centrifugal force, everything balances out. But the three in the line, L1, L2, and L3, these are unstable points. Yes, if you go to L1 between the Earth and the Sun and, and everything is perfectly balanced, if you just nudge just a tiny bit, well, then you're going to end up falling to the earth or falling to the sun. You won't be able to avoid it. And so it's, it is a balance point, but it's like balancing a pencil on its tip. If you just like look at it wrong, it's going to fall over. So that's the same for L2 and L3. Now, but L4 and L5 are actually stable points. These are places where the gravitational and centrifugal forces balance each other out. And if you nudge away from them a little bit, you'll tend to fall back towards them. Now, if you push yourself too hard, of course, you're going to go flying out into the solar system. Uh, so don't, don't push this. But if you just nudge yourself a little, you're going to hang out around L4 and L5. And the reason for this is, of all things, the Coriolis force or Coriolis effect. 
Uh, don't forget that the, the, everything in the solar system is rotating and moving. All the planets are orbiting. And if you're at L4 or L5, you are orbiting the sun. The Coriolis effect appears in rotating systems. This is how we get uh, like hurricanes and, and toilet water spinning one way. Water spins the opposite way. It really freaks you out the first time you see it. I know that's not actually a thing, but, but you get the idea. It's all the Coriolis effect. This appears in rotating systems. It turns out at L4 and L5, if you drift away from it, just a little bit, the Coriolis effect or force nudges you Back. So if you go a little bit too far away, outer of the L4 or L5, you'll get mud nudged inward. And if you go inwards of it, you'll get nudged outwards. So you will tend to hang out at L4 and L5. The stability of L4 and L5 has interesting implications for our solar system because this is where planets can collect some junk. Oh, the best example is Jupiter. Jupiter the er, Jupiter Sun system has five Lagrange points. L4 and L5 for Jupiter are sitting 60 degrees in front of and behind Jupiter itself. These are places of equilibrium and places of stability. And rocks collect there. Jupiter has a collection of asteroids leaving it in its orbit and following in its orbit. So what a great validation of the math of Newton and the work of Euler and Lagrange uh, to give us this result, the prediction that there sh this is a point of stability. If you want proof, take a picture of these asteroids because they're hanging out right there. We call these the Trojan asteroids. And there's a good collection of them right there in the in the Jupiter orbit. There are also some grains of dust and some tiny asteroids hanging out at the Lagrange points for the Earth-Sun system um, and so on. So that that's pretty cool. Uh, in terms of space flight, the other Lagrange points are also very useful. Uh, uh, L3 sitting on the opposite side of the sun, not super useful. L1 is pretty interesting because if you were to put a satellite there, then it's always gonna be in the same line as the Earth and the sun. So if you wanna do say solar observations, like I don't know, with NASA's SOHO instrument, uh, you can put your cameras at the sun and the sun's always going to be right in front of you all the time. And then you can put your communications gear on the back and the, and the earth is always going to be behind you all the time. You're always going to stay in this line all the time. And so that's, that's pretty handy. And then on the opposite side, we have L2. Uh, and L2 has a collection of satellites there. We've got James Webb up there. We have WMAP. We have Planck. Uh, it's a great place to go in the outer solar system or away from the Earth. It's about three times further away from, than the moon is. Uh, and so, it, again, it puts the Earth behind you. So you always know where the Earth is. You can point your communication arrays there. It also puts the sun behind you all the time. So you can know you don't have to repoint your solar panels. You're always going to be in sun. Sunlight. And if you're a kind of instrument that needs to be chilled out, like say you're studying microwave or infrared radiation, well then you can deploy a big shield or a coolant system and you know you only have to work on this side to block all that sunlight and all your instruments are going to be just fine. You can't park a satellite there at L2 or L1 because those are unstable positions, but they are places of equilibrium. That means that where they are, the gravitational forces of the sun and, and the earth are, are minimal. They, they, almost, they almost perfectly cancel each other out in the vicinity of those Lagrange points. So if you put a satellite there and it starts to drift away, you don't have to work very hard to put it back. So we like putting satellites here at L1 and L2 because they don't need to use a lot of fuel to stay exactly where they are. Are. So thank you, Lagrange, or should we say Lagrangea? Thank you so much. Uh, please go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to keep the show going. That is the best way to support the show. I guarantee it. And I'll see you next time.